Hello and welcome to episode 27 of Question and Answer. I am your host, Panyol Basop, and this is your co-host, Peepers. And um, I'm doing it out here on the veranda as a change of pace and uh, moving the glass so the kitty doesn't uh, drink my Red Bull and lemonade. And I've got the usual longish list of good questions to try to answer. And so I'm going to try and do that with the kitty walking all over my lap. So the first question is from Bodhisatta969. And Bodhisatta969 says, I have already asked several questions via email to Theravada temples or sanghas in Germany, which are mainly led and attended by Thais. Unfortunately, questions or suggestions are usually not answered at all. Hence my question, isn't there a need for dedicated people within these sanghas who also want to advance Buddhism in Western countries? Those who want to become Buddhists integrate those more who are interested in Buddhism too. I know Buddhism doesn't really proselytize, but isn't it worth spreading the teaching? And if those in charge are not interested in spreading Buddhism, step by step, those who are willing should take over. Well, that's, that's a good question. And due to my uh, recording to my years of experience living in Asian temples in the West, at least a few years, um, the thing is, Asian monks have a very different outlook on reality and on Buddhism than Westerners do. So that even when Western or when Asian monks, like Burmese monks, is what I mainly have experience with, when Burmese monks try to teach to Westerners, um, there's like a culture gap. There's a culture barrier. You know, they, they have like a medieval attitude towards... Um, towards Buddhism in general. I mean, they just consider everything in their tradition to be just gospel. And Westerners just don't, don't really swing that way. Like Venerable Tong Puluciato, who was a, a great monk, a, a wise monk, he would come to America and give sermons and he'd be mentioning, you know, the flat earth floating on water and Buddhist cosmology and so forth that most Westerners really can't take it very serious, including most monks. So that's a major problem with Asian temples promulgating Dhamma is that Asian monks have an approach to Buddhism that most Westerners um, just don't, I mean, they, they don't find it acceptable. It's just a non-starter. And there are some Asian monks who try to become fluent in English because there's also the language barrier. And, um, you know, they try... And there are certain types of Westerners, you know, just the faith-oriented Westerners, who are willing to um, accept whatever they're told with regard to Buddhism from, you know, an exotic Asian monk. And, um, but, I mean, it's just not going to be the majority of people who might potentially be interested in, in Theravada Buddhism. So it's going to take Western monks, I think, who are going to be um, mainly promulgating Theravada Buddhism or anything remotely resembling traditional Theravada Buddhism in the West because as you may know Western lay people who teach Theravada mostly are teaching a very watered down and mutated version of Theravada and it may take uh, a mutated version of Theravada with certain things omitted like the cosmology at least you omit the, the part about taking it seriously um, in order for really uh, Theravada Buddhism to strike traction, to take root in the West, which it really hasn't done very well yet, I have to admit. And part of the reason for that is that uh, Theravada Buddhism is ancient Indian. It was designed to fit ancient Indian culture. And uh, it has been accepted by um, certain Asian cultures that were based on classical India, Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, all of them have as their classical civilization that they turn to for culture, 
ancient India, just like in the West, we turn to Rome or and to some degree Greece. Um, I mean, mainly Western Europe and America have their culture um, like resting upon the foundation, the classical foundation of Rome. And in Southeast Asia, most of Southeast Asia and also Sri Lanka, they're looking to India for their classical inspiration or just their, their wise ancients. And so it, it fit easier. It worked better for Southeast Asia than it's working for the modern West with regard to accepting an ancient Indian tradition with ancient Indian cosmology and ancient Indian just assumptions about reality. So let's get back to this question here a little bit. Isn't there a need for dedicated people within these Sanghas who also want to advance Buddhism in Western countries? Well, I think most of them do want to advance Buddhism other than just the Asian monks who just want to live like kind of like neutered house cats in a temple and just lie around and get attention from lay people and get fed every day. I mean, there are monks like that too, but um, a lot of them really would like to spread Dhamma in the West. They would like to become great teachers in the West if possible, um, either for you know personal reasons or just for the selfless desire to promulgate Dhamma. But as I say, there is a cultural barrier that uh, really interferes with that. So uh, Western Buddhism is going to have to change to some degree. I mean, like... Theravada Buddhism, if it's going to prosper in the West, it is going to have to change to some degree. Otherwise, it's just doomed to be a fringe movement. Or it's going to be, it's doomed to be what it's sort of becoming now, which is just a, a very watered down, mutated, semi semblance of Theravada Buddhism. And there'll be a, a few more questions about that particular issue a little farther down on the scroll here. Um, but it's, that's like the big issue is like, what can you change? What can you not change? Or what should you not change? And, uh, of course, different people are going to have different ideas about that, but that's not really the question here. So I think I may just move on. So the next question is from New Squam. And New Squam says, what, which Nikaya is there behind you? He's referring to the last Q and A that I did. I had, I usually do Q and A's in in uh, the spare bedroom with it's, it's sort of like an office and, and den and so forth. And I've got a bookcase behind me and like right there in most of these Q and a videos, there's a big Brown book that he's asking about. And that's uh Bhikkhu Bodhi's and Yanamoli's translation of the uh, Majjhima Nikaya. Let's see. He's, he asked, which Nikaya is there behind you? I've noticed cover from wisdom publications. Yeah. So the Brown, the Brown one, from Wisdom Publications is the Majjhima Nikaya. And um, the original translation was by Nyana Moli, who was a great translator. He was really brilliant. And, uh, but he was a little idiosyncratic. He had some strange ideas about translating. For example, he tried very hard to have one Pali word get translated always into the same English word. And different poly i mean the same poly word can have different meanings according to different contexts and he's trying to come up with an english word that comes as close to that as possible and um like brahma he div he interpreted as divine so like a brahman he would call a divine or you know the brahma loka is the divine world and so forth so um that was just a little too uh unorthodox for bhikkhu bodhi who is a good translator despite his his politics he is one of the best translators we've got so he just sort of made it a little more orthodox you know just using the usual terms you know sati is mindfulness for example and um so he just sort of uh smoothed out some of the some of the stranger parts of nana moli's translation but nana moli was an excellent translator and uh it might have been best just to have left it the way it was but there we are. Bhikkhu Bodhi has, uh, he was, he's a grown up man. He can make his own decisions, I suppose. So yeah, the, the answer to that is it's the Majjhima Nikaya. So the next question is from Joe Doe. And Joe Doe asks, do you know of any techniques to overcome sleepiness when it arises in meditation? And there are, there's at least one entire discourse 
um, probably to be found in Winya or the rules of monastic discipline, in which the Buddha is telling a monk what to do if he's if he's really sleepy. You know, he's supposed to be meditating. You're not supposed to sleep a lot. Ideally, a monk who's a serious meditator should only sleep about four hours a night. And I tried that, and it is not easy. I only managed one month averaging less than four hours every night, and that was some of the best meditation of my life. If my meditation is not going well, I just need to sleep more. But um, do I know of any techniques for overcoming sleepiness when it arises in meditation? Um, possibly one of the easiest techniques is just get up and do walking meditation because it's very difficult to fall asleep when you're walking. I, uh, I've been told that it is possible, but um, you know, setting aside sleepwalking, but um, that that's one. Another. Um, I, I should have looked up the discourse, but um, I just play these uh, off the cuff here. And uh, I remember, you know, one is visualizing light. Um, one is just sort of rubbing your face and rubbing your, pulling on your ears and that kind of a thing. Um, one is uh, like the standard Western um, technique of just splashing cold water on your face. That works too. Um, there is one kind of naughty one that I came up with um, when I was living in a Burmese forest. And that was the same time that I was doing less than four hours a night of sleep. Um, I had this rule that I didn't have uh, an alarm clock, but I had this rule that if I wake up and I've already slept at least four hours, I have to get up. And I was keeping track of how much I was sleeping. And um, I had... It was, it was like a desperation technique. I mean, I'm not necessarily endorsing this, but it did work for me. And that is just to, uh, uh, how do I say this? Um, I would sort of fondle myself a little bit to kind of cause arousal, and then I would stop. And then um, just the arousal, I mean, obviously, just from the, the word arousal indicates that, you know, you're, you're more awake. And so that worked for me, although... It might not work if you're like at a meditation retreat or some such. You might get kicked out. But I was living by myself in the forest at the time. Um, let's see, what other techniques? I mean, just remonstrating with yourself, I suppose. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think those are the, the main ones that, that are mentioned in the text. Uh, one is, is get, getting up and doing walking meditation, visualizing light splashing water on your face or just like rubbing and pulling on your on your, your ears or you know rubbing your face and that sort of thing to kind of get the circulation going more um, I suppose um, getting back to that kind of arousal technique just thinking any kind of thought that gets your heart beating faster is going to is going to help maybe uh, do a little contemplation of death or something but um, yeah if you look in the in the polytext there are actual discourses um, explaining what to do and the kitty is rubbing up against the microphone like a silly kitty so i'll just move on to the next question and the next question is also by joe doe and that is do you believe levitation is real well i do believe that it's possible and um i think that it probably has happened not only in buddhists and hindus but uh, there was some famous Catholic, I think he was a, a Catholic monk. He's a saint. Saint. It, it wasn't Saint Francis of Assisi, but I think it might have been another Saint Francis. It was some saint that had a, a sort of common saint name with with a more famous uh, person with the same name. But um, there was some English. I think he was some sort of English uh, minister or something like like a political minister, and. Um, he very much, I mean, he heard the rumors of this, this Christian monk who would levitate. And so he actually hid in a closet and, and, and is like looking through the crack in the door to, uh, to see this, this monk. And he, apparent, according to the story, he did meditate or, or levitate. And then he converted over to Roman Catholicism. And uh, I guess um, St. Teresa of Avila would go into such ecstasies when she would take communion which is a big deal among some Catholics because they think they're actually committing ritual cannibalism of Jesus. So, I mean, she would go into such ecstasies that she would just rise up in front of entire congregations, supposedly, according to the story. So, um, I believe anything is 
is possible just about so if levitation can be imagined that would make it possible at least in a metaphysical sense so yeah and then joe doe says cheers mate so yeah cheers and so i'll just move on to the next question by fred fred says from what i can understand there was no chanting at the buddhist time is chanting unnecessary cognition well yes and no with regard to whether there was chanting in the buddhist time which is um i mean it depends on how you would define chanting i guess because in the buddhist time there was i mean the scriptures were not written down the teachings of the buddha were not written down and so they had to be memorized and so there was a lot of that going back to very ancient times um of just memorizing by heart certain teachings and then you would generally recite it which could be called chanting as a way of not forgetting it and i used to do a lot of a lot of that sort of thing although i've forgotten pretty much everything except the metta sutta and a few little bits and pieces um but with regard to actual chanting like in a in a sing-song voice i mean you're not using a regular conversational tone of voice like i'm using now um, it's actually against the rules of monastic discipline a monk is not supposed to recite in a sing-song voice even though lots of them do it in fact some burmese monks that i have i have met will actually cultivate their own peculiar sing-song voice when they chant as a kind of hallmark you know sort of their own personal gimmick and the kitty's rubbing up against the microphone again yeah so let's see where was i oh yeah the chanting so technically chanting in a kind of sing-song voice is actually against the rules even though plenty of monks do it um with regard to uh just reciting um in a in a for chanting purposes like like for not just for remembering something or you know reciting it to someone else so they can hear it is you know sort of like protection chants and so forth and they go back to ancient times i mean it's i mean one can debate whether the buddha himself originally taught that you should chant the metta sutta to protect you from spirits for example or that you should um chant the kanda sutta or recite the kanda sutta to protect protect you from like snake bites but they are found in the text like the kanda sutta is found in winia or the the book of books of monastic discipline that some monk was bitten by a snake and died and so the buddha taught the kanda sutta which is sending metta and blessings to all beings including legless ones which are snakes and uh according to uh, the text you know if you chant the sutta then um you won't die from snake bite even if you are bitten you will survive so um otherwise i mean chanting is unnecessary cognition it can be used as a kind of meditation it's sort of a prolonged mantra or something so i mean it does have a function i think it is acceptable in orthodox buddhism to chant suttas not only so that you don't forget them but it's just your mind is on something wholesome you know it, it gets your mind onto something wholesome and that reminds me that um i had a, a friend in burma he was a texan hermit who lived in this big hollow tree and he said one time he was bitten by one of those big orange centipedes or these giant centipedes that live in southeast asia and um you know they're as big around as your finger and they got these big fangs on them and uh, i've met a few people who have been bitten by them and this this hermit said that uh, it hurts so bad you can't do anything you can't meditate you can't sleep so he would just sit there and and chant just to get his mind off the pain and um you know he just kind of had his mind on something more positive or wholesome so i mean for that purpose you you could do chanting also just to get your mind focused on something relatively wholesome um but although of course it helps if you understand what you're chanting if you're chanting in pali and you don't know pali you've just memorized the sounds so that you're you're chanting this blah 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 which it i mean some people do that um i wouldn't expect nearly as much of a benefit um as if you were um, actually understanding what you were chanting so the next question is from nardi and nardi says I have a dilemma in the issue of mindfulness. 
do you consider forcing with all the force oneself to hear now as mindfulness? Or mindfulness is just a passive observation of whatever appears? So that seems to be the main question. The next is explanatory. It's like, whenever I try to be mindful in the daily life, I end up meditating at work. I think I always had this extremist mindset and now I know how to do something. I do it till I go in depth. Um, or once I know how to do something, I do it till I go in depth. I have also this other tendency of escaping reality and that's why I wanted to become a monk for some years. Sometimes co-workers think I'm distracted while I'm basically meditating and focusing on something else. When I force myself with all my will just here now without observing nothing, I am focused like a hunting animal and to me everything is more easy. I do this since I was a kid mostly because I don't like my thoughts and feelings which are very dark and by doing these, this, these things don't bother me. And by doing this, things don't bother me. Let's say my family lives a very bad karma and a lot of bad things has happened to my ancestors including disputes among family members, killings, persecutions from the communist regime and as some people say black magic so um the uh the main question here is just the first part um do you consider forcing with all the force oneself to hear now as mindfulness or mindfulness is just a passive observation of whatever appears so it can be either way i mean beginning level mindfulness you may be uh, doing like what the Mahasi method tells you to do. It's like when you are mindfully noting something, it's like you're hitting it with a stick. You know, it's like your attention is the stick and you're just tapping it over and over again and labeling it, you know, giving it some word, some, some label. Um, but as you get better at it, it becomes more and more effortless. So either way, it could be mindfulness. So long as you are focused on whatever is in the here and now, um, I mean, there are other kinds of mindfulness. You can be mindful of the qualities of the Buddha, for example. But with regard to Satipatthana, um, in this sense, it's, um, you know, you're just in the present moment. And at first, if you're not good at it yet, you know, your mind just keeps wandering. You know, your mind has this excess energy. You have to apply the energy of your mind to some kind of busy work to keep it from wandering away again and again. And that includes the 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 labeling for example and then the better you get at it the more effortless it becomes until ideally um you just get to the point where you're just always being mindful like an like an arahant presumably would be so either way works although if you're able to be mindful effortlessly that is better than uh, pounding away at it but pounding away at it is better than just just daydreaming and fantasizing and thinking about what you want for dinner. So the next question is from Rob, alias Dhamma Farmer. And Rob says, Panyo, what are your thoughts on mindfulness in terms of physical exercise? One of your previous, one of your previous Q&A, you mentioned the method of sheet metal working and your application in terms of mindfulness to that task. I have found great benefits of running or slow jogging with a low heart rate over the last year, but have only just come to think of this as greatly beneficial in terms of being in the present, staying with the breath, and not allowing the mind to wander. It produces good and clarifying mental states with science backing up the claims in terms of endorphins and culmination of mitochondria as examples. I remember a while back hearing of a sect of monks that would run back-to-back -back marathons to enhance spiritual practice, although I may have this wrong. What are your thoughts, and are there any scriptural examples of physical training as such? I would add that 2,500 years ago, people would have walked an awful lot more and would not have being as fat and lazy as today, and would not have being as fat and lazy as today. So this concept of exercise may be a bit too modern. Cheers. Okay, well, monks are allowed to exercise just for the sake of being healthy, although um, if it's for the sake of looking buff or self-beautification or anything, then it is uh, not permitted. Strongly discouraged. So, let's see, 
where, where, where are we getting to the question part here? I found great benefits in running the slow jogging. Um, yeah, I mean, with regard to scriptural examples of physical training, really, there is the only exercise that is encouraged for monks is walking. Like, um, monks would uh, have, like, indigestion or something, like, right after they ate their daily meal, for example, and the Buddha encouraged them to do walking meditation. But really, the whole point of being a monk is just to be healthy enough to practice Dhamma I mean, you're not going for a good physique, necessarily. I mean, they tended to be pretty skinny. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's like swimming for exercise is, I mean, it's, it's very questionable. Um, weightlifting, that kind of thing, calisthenics. I mean, there's no endorsement of it in the, in the ancient polytext that I'm aware of. Um, Although, I mean, there's, there's just no mention of it. I think that calisthenics, it might have been known to, I don't know, gladiators or, or soldiers or something. You know, they would, ancient soldiers might train with lead swords just to, you know, strengthen their arms. But, um, yeah, for monks, it's, I mean, Buddhism is very otherworldly, especially, you know, ancient Buddhism. And so... Yeah, being healthy is one thing, but uh, just being buff or, or whatever is something else. So, yeah, I think ancient India, it just wasn't as, like, matter-oriented. You know, your body was just this thing that you wore, and if you were really striving for Dhamma, it was just this thing that you used to practice Dhamma. So, yeah, there's not much mention in all of physical training. I mean, there, there came to be that in other schools, you know, like Shaolin, anyone who watched the old TV show Kung Fu or the various wire fu movies may know that, uh, you know, some Mahayana sects, um, they, would, they would practice, you know, martial arts at the very least, dodging spears or whatever. So there is that, but that was more of a, a mindfulness exercise, I think, than uh, a way of exercising the body and strengthening it. Um, yeah, in Buddhism, it's just, you know, I guess you'd be more like water. You know, the strength of water, like the Tao Te Ching, is more than, you know, what is hard and is brittle and breaks, but what is soft and, and flows, you know, it's, it's more flexible and uh, less likely to be damaged or something. So, yeah, I guess uh, I guess that kind of answers that question. There's really not much mention of uh, physical exercise, you know, as you know, for the sake of fitness in in the text. It's just a, uh, I guess that's more of a modern concept, or uh, if it's pre-modern, it was uh, for gladiators and things that were really this worldly instead of you know striving for something beyond this world. Uh, and one of the dogs is crying. And we'll get to that. we got a question about dogs coming up. So I think I'll just move on to the next question. And Rob, alias Dhamma Farmer, says, I've been sitting, no, I've been sifting through the older Q&As and playing catch-up on missed episodes. I found myself in hysterical laughter in some parts, especially when you read the pee-pee-poo-poo gay butt sex questions from a bizarre commenter with a straight face. It got me thinking, what is the most stupid question you have ever been asked? Also, what is the most bizarre or excommunication level thing anyone has ever asked you to do? Loving the Q&As, books and content, sincerely, thanks, and meta. Um, let's see, what's... I guess this is a two-part question. So, what's the most stupid question you have ever been asked? Well, as the saying goes, there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid people. But um, it seems to me that the questions I receive, unless they're like pointed rhetorical questions trying to make a point, um, I've, I've received some strange ones, but I wouldn't say that any of them is really bad or stupid. I mean, if they really want to know the answer, but usually when you come up with stupid or just stupidity, 
you know, with regard to comments and so forth, is people making assertions. It's, they're not asking questions because they think they already know the answers. Those are the stupidest people. The people that are so sure that they know everything, or at least everything, you know, that's relevant at, at the moment, that, um, yeah, those, those are the, the people that make the stupidest remarks. And, um, I mean, I don't want to be singling out anybody, but I would say that, yeah, the, the most stupidity that you, you come upon is people just making flat out assertions. You know, they're not asking questions because if you're asking a question, it's, it's a kind of humility, you know, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of humility to ask a question because you are tacitly admitting that you don't know. Unless, of course, it's like a pointed, you know, sort of a naughty question. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to single out anybody and hurt somebody's feelings or something. So I'll just move on to the next part of this question, which, what is the most bizarre or excommunication level thing anyone has ever asked you to do? Um, I think probably it would just be like people who were, there were a few Western people who were my supporters. You know, they were actually supporting me. They're just saying, why don't you just drop out and get a job? You know, they just did not see the point of having to feed a monk every day. You know, the monk isn't allowed to store his food. He had, and he has to have somebody give him food every morning if he's going to eat. And a lot of Western Buddhists, people who consider themselves to be sincere Buddhists or even Buddhist teachers, they just don't get it. They don't see the point of that. So, I mean, that's not really excommunication level, but it's it's you know, being derobed from the Sangha level because they're just asking, you know, why don't you just quit? Because they, they really do not see the point of being a monk or they don't think that it's important enough that uh, people should actually do it, especially in the West. Um, with regard to a bizarre question or a bizarre thing anyone has ever asked me to do, man, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, just why don't you just, uh, you know, have sex or something, you know, it'd be something like that, I think, you know, while still being a monk, that is. So, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint Rob in his question for, uh, stupid and questions and bizarre requests, but, um, none really come to mind to tell you the truth. So, sorry. Maybe, maybe someone can ask a really stupid question next time and then I can, uh, I can bring it up. So next question, also from uh, Rob alias Dhamma Farmer. And he says, I recently read a comment section interaction between you and someone on the politically incorrect Theravada video with Ajahn Punadamo and Brian. The person insisted that the Buddha did not even teach about rebirth. Could you explain if this is some kind of edgy shit posting, or there are some Buddhists who question the idea of rebirth? By all rights, if you don't believe in rebirth, then the vast majority of the Buddha's teachings are automatically invalid for that individual. Thank you. Well, as it turned out, just a few nights ago, I watched a debate between Ajahn Brahmali, I think is his name, and Stephen Batchelor on traditionalism versus secularism in Theravada Buddhism. And it was a good debate. I would, I would recommend it. Maybe I might even include the link below this video. Um, but Stephen Batchelor considers himself to be a Buddhist. He's written books about it. He's, he was a Buddhist monk. I think he was a Tibetan monk for a few years, at least. He knows a lot about Buddhism. He just doesn't believe in rebirth. And, um, it seems weird to me that, I mean, on the one hand, Buddhists believe in the first noble truth. To exist is to suffer. But if you don't believe in rebirth, then it seems like the, the logical, obvious thing to do would just be to commit suicide. Not that I'm advising anyone to commit suicide, but that would just seem to be the logical conclusion. You know, if to exist is to suffer, and you want to be free of suffering, and there is no rebirth, well, there you go. But uh, yeah, apparently a lot of Westerners, I'm, I, I assume I have probably met at least one Asian Buddhist who didn't believe in rebirth. But I mean, it, there's a lot of it in the West. It's, it's called secular Buddhism, I think. And Stephen Batchelor was saying, 
you know, maybe the Buddha was just, uh, you know, he was a product of his culture. The culture believed in reincarnation. And so he was just going along with that. And it doesn't necessarily make it true, which was, I think, is kind of a, a weak argument because, I mean, if you don't want to follow what the Buddha said, I mean, nobody's forcing you to be a Buddhist, especially in the West. So, I mean, if he wants to believe some spiritual system that doesn't include rebirth, why doesn't he just, you know, follow his own idea and not necessarily call it Buddhism? So, I think a stronger argument, which might have got him to uh, win the debate with Ajahn Brahmali, um, is you start with a text like the Atakawaga, like the, in my opinion, the oldest large chunk of really archaic early Buddhism that still exists is the Atakawaga of the Sutanipata. And it's not dealing with metaphysics or rebirth. It's, it's just dealing with the practical, you know, in this moment process of waking up. And it's don't believe anything. Don't, I mean, don't, I mean, if, if you believe something, it's practically delusion because belief is the idea that you know something that you don't really know. So, belief, um, I mean, just concepts are not really not going to encapsulate reality. They're not going to contain reality other than just the underlying reality of, of the consciousness, uh, just underlying the, the belief. But um, perception is samsara. So, I mean, if you wanted to really be a Buddhist that didn't believe in rebirth, I mean, you shouldn't disbelieve in rebirth either because the Atika Waga, which is, as I say, is very ancient, very archaic, um, it says don't believe anything. So if you disbelieve in rebirth, that's just a belief in non-rebirth. It's still a positive belief, just couched in negative terms. Um, so then, then the onus would be on the person who's saying that, uh, you know, all the other stuff added on where, where it is talking about rebirth and so forth is uh, just later additions you know, that cropped up during the first hundred years or so of uh, Buddhism as a, as, a, as a religion or as a philosophical or spiritual system. So, yeah, I think if you're a Buddhist and you don't believe in rebirth, then, I mean, you shouldn't believe in anything. Then you'll be following what the Atika Waga teaches anyway. But if you're believing this and that, I mean, you're just picking and choosing the parts you want to believe. I mean, you should have a really good reason for rejecting something. Like Abhidhamma Pitaka, there's a list of reasons I've written down elsewhere why it's unlikely that the Buddha himself taught Abhidhamma, even though it's the third Pitaka of the three Pitakas, you know, it's the third part of the Pali Tipitaka, the scriptures of, of Theravada Buddhism. But still, there is quite a lot of persuasive evidence that the Buddha didn't teach Abhidhamma personally. It's sort of like a, a commentary that got canonized, like around the Third Council. So that would be uh, at least a couple hundred years after the time of the Buddha. So, yeah, let's see. I, I suppose I should go back to this question. I, sometimes I, I kind of answer at length until I've forgotten the exact question here. Could you explain if this is some kind of edgy shitposting? No, I don't think so. Or are there some Buddhists who question the idea of rebirth? Yeah, obviously, like Stephen Batchelor would be one of the more famous ones. By all rights, if you don't believe in rebirth, and the vast majority of Buddhist teachings are automatically invalid for that individual. Well, the vast majority of the teachings of the Pali Canon would be, yeah. And the Buddha himself, in really ancient texts, does mention rebirth. Like um, the second sutta of the of the Digha Nikaya, which is just the second sutta of the Pali text, you know, the second discourse of all the Buddha scriptures is um, the Samanya Pala Sutta, where the Buddha is um, telling King Ajatasattu the, the, the fruits of living a monastic life or the life of a renunciant. And he goes in ascending order and up towards the top, there's the psychic powers that can be cultivated, including memory of one's past lives. And um, Ajahn Brahmali, in, in the debate of traditionalism versus secularism, with he, he, of course, being the traditionalist, was really pounding away at the whole idea of rebirth. How, you know, that's really the point of, of becoming enlightened is ending rebirth. 
And he's saying that you don't fully understand rebirth until you become enlightened. And then it just becomes clear. It's like the turning on of a light or the lighting of a lamp, I should say. So, yeah, I mean, if you don't believe in rebirth, you don't believe in karma, you don't believe in dependent core rising or whatever. I mean, nobody's forcing you to be a Buddhist. Just believe what you want to believe. But uh, you should be careful about um, calling yourself a Buddhist while at the same time believing in some cases maybe the exact opposite of Dhamma. And there is a lot of that in the West lately because cultural Marxism or emancipatory politics or progressivism or whatever you want to call it is infiltrating pretty much all of the liberal leaning religious systems and turning it all into, you know, like Black Lives Matter and global warming and, and gay pride and this sort of thing to the point that like modern leftist uh, Unitarianism, modern leftist Methodism, and modern leftist Theravada in the West resemble each other more than they resemble the original versions of those three systems. So, yeah. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is also from Rob Dama Farmer, who has many questions, which is good. I'm not complaining. And he says, was the Noble Eightfold Path primarily aimed at lay people rather than monks? I don't think so, because early Buddhism was aimed primarily at monks. I mean, the Buddha tossed a bone to the lay people sometimes. Five precepts, a few, a few suttas um, discussing, you know, the, the, the duties of a good Buddhist lay person and so forth. But almost all suttas are directed towards monks, including... Um, the first mention of the Noble Eightfold Path, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I might just uh, make a fool of myself here, but if I'm not mistaken, the uh, Dhammachaka Pawatana Sutta, which is considered to be uh, the Buddha's first formal discourse after his enlightenment, at least according to tradition, um, it mentions the Four Noble Truths. So the Noble Eightfold Path is uh, the elaborated version of the Fourth Noble Truth. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's... Buddhism was originally primarily aimed at monks. So the, the Eightfold Path was, um, may have been devised by monks. It may have been that originally there was just a path, there is a way, and then it got systematized and you know complicated and uh, turned into the Eightfold Path. There are a few suttas that mention a Tenfold Path, which can be used as uh, a bit of evidence that, um, you know, it. It was sort of in a state of evolution before they settled on these eight. So, I mean, there, and there are certain variations of the eightfold path also, like um, it's kind of a sevenfold path, all of which culminate in sama samadhi, you know, right, right uh, jhana, right meditation. So, yeah, the, I guess the easy qu answer to that question is, uh, was the Noble Eightfold Path primarily aimed at lay people? No, I don't think so. So the next question from Rob, Dhamma Farmer. Can the non-renunciant spiritual loner make progress? Uh, yeah, anybody can make progress. I mean, even, you know, somebody's like, uh, they got lots of bad habits, even though they're a non-renunciant uh, lay person. Um, just, you know, cleaning up your act, you know, maybe you start watching Jordan Peterson videos and, and he just, you know, inspires you to, to uh, clean your room and all that. Uh, take more responsibility for your own self, your own successes and failures and all that, then uh, yeah. And some people can uh, make progress just accidentally. You know, you have somebody, you know, they're a selfish person, that, they're very superficial and so forth, and then they get cancer maybe. They almost die in a car wreck. You know, somebody close to them dies, and that can just really get them thinking about, you know, I'm not going to live forever, and I shouldn't waste this life. And then they can really make progress. So, yeah, anybody can make progress. It's just that being a monk was designed originally as a way of facilitating making progress because you're dedicating your life to making progress. You're not dedicating your life to making money and so forth with the making progress part being sort of around the edges of all this necessary bill paying stuff you got to do. So, yeah, I mean, that's an emphatic yes, definitely. The non-renunciant spiritual learner can make progress. I mean, I made progress 
before I became a monk to the point that I was really inspired to become a monk just because I wanted to make more progress. But um, yeah, so the answer is yes. So I'll just move on to uh, Rob Dhamma Farmer's last question here. And he's saying, I'm sure you will be identified for supervisory qualities at the job soon enough. He's referring to my job at the sheet metal shop. He's uh, being very complimentary. Hypothetically, if you landed a position in which man management was required, then what orthodox Theravadan qualities or teachings would you apply to your daily role as a leader? I am taking notes as I have to manage people daily, but never considered them to be much leadership Dhamma teachings other than the qualities of kings, etc. Thanks again, Rob. Well, equanimity is good. You know, I mean, if you're frazzled under stress, it's going to make you less of a good manager than if you keep your head under stress. You know, things, you know, the shit hits the fan at work and, and you just, you know, keep your calm and, and get to solving things instead of, you know, just getting sucked into it and, you know, yelling or whatever, then, yeah, I mean, that would, that would help you. Just the cultivation of equanimity. Um, honesty, obviously, you know, if, if you live a, you know, you're like an upstanding, more or less virtuous person, you're the people that are working for you will, you know, unless they're totally insensitive, will pick up on that and have more respect for you, be more willing to do what you ask, especially if they're confident that you're going to have them doing something that isn't wrong. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like any kind of leader. Um, if he's got the respect of the people that he's leading, he's going to do a, a better job as a general rule than people that are just consider him to be just a, a jerk. And there are a lot of leaders like that, a lot of jerks that are leaders. I'm fortunate not to have jerks as my leaders at work. In fact, one reason why my job is as, um, I don't know, why the, why the business is as in as good of, of a situation as it is, is that the the owner of the business is an evangelical Christian who takes certain virtues, including not swindling customers, very seriously. And um, just yesterday, I had a customer. I was loading stuff onto his his vehicle with a forklift, and um, he he said that uh, you know some some places you go to, they, you, you just feel unwelcome. But here, I feel like everyone cares, and that was nice. And um, yeah, if people think that, uh, you know, you got compassion and honesty and, and so forth. And, you know, it's just, it's not something that in specific that you're cultivating. It's just that uh, just through practicing Dhamma and just generally cultivating yourself, trying to make spiritual progress, it's going to, it's going to rub off on other people. So, and just try to be fair, obviously. So I don't know how well I answered that because I'm really not a, a manager. I was the abbot of a monastery for a while, but um, I don't know. I think um, being a, a warehouse manager or something might be a little different. But there would be some overlap, I guess. So the next question is from the Arya Suwasti Project. And the Arya Suwasti Project says, Greetings, Panyo. In Hinduism, as you probably know, uh, recognize yugas or age of time. Does Buddhism recognize something like this? And would you say that we are in a Kali Yuga or some other factor of time? Much respect, Sadhu. Well, yeah, Buddhism has adopted the, the ancient Indian you know, cycles. And um, so there are yugas. Um, whether we are in the Kali Yuga or not is questionable. Some people just, you know, have no doubt we've got to be in the Kali Yuga or an age of spiritual darkness and so forth. But I'm pretty well acquainted with history, and I don't think things are really all that awful. I mean, people aren't very religious in the West, but still, I mean, you've got fewer psychopathic kings and emperors and fewer cannibals and, and you know, fewer... Uh, the quite infested forests where you know you gotta have you know soldiers accompany you in order to keep you from being killed and robbed or whatever. Um, but the, the the main thing for me is according to Buddhism, when you're in like the golden age, people live astronomically long lives and it's all justice. You've got like the Chakravartin, the the wheel turning monarch who rules the world in peace and virtue, and then things gradually get worse and worse after that and 
accompanying the things getting worse and worse spiritually, the, the lifespan gets shorter and shorter until you're down to like, I think it's like what, 14 years, seven years, something like that. People start cannibalizing each other. Things get really awful. And of course, um, you know, that's not happening now. In fact, I would say over the past few hundred years, um, the average lifespan has been increasing instead of decreasing. So it could be that these ages, I mean, they're not just a uniform decline. It could be like you go down like this and then you got like a, a little upsurge, sort of like global warming is supposed to be doing or something. You know, it's, it's going a certain direction. You got a little jog and then it goes the other way and then another jog. It could be that we're in a jog. I don't know. And the kitty is... Uh, being very, very friendly or bored or something. So let's see. In Hinduism, I'll just read the question again. I want to make sure that I get this. In Hinduism, as you probably know, recognize yugas or age of time. Does Buddhism recognize something like this? Yes, yes. And would you say that we are in a Kali Yuga? Um, I really don't think so. I don't. I mean, from the Hindu point of view, yeah, because everyone says so. But in the Buddhist point of view, um, I mean, spiritually, maybe we're, we're doing worse, although it's hard to say how well off spiritually like a medieval European peasant was. You know, they had their Catholicism, they believed it without question, but were they happier or wiser or better off than us is hard to say because you can't really get into their mind other than maybe read some of the stuff that they wrote. And it was only the really educated people that were writing stuff because the uneducated people didn't know how. So, yeah, I've thought about this before. I'm just going with the, the Buddhist description of the decline into, like, the worst of the, the Kali Yuga. I don't think we're even close to that yet. So we got something to look forward to. And I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Chakra Gosha. And Chakra Gosha says... In Zen, there is a tradition of chanting the ancestral line, starting from Vipassi Buddha and the other six predecessor Buddhas, and then listing the chain of teachers and students by name from Gautama Buddha to Mahakasapa to Ananda and so forth up until the present. Is there a comparable tradition of maintaining such a list in Theravada? If not a complete list, how far back can a typical Theravada monk trace his ordination line? Um... Well, this is sort of like a two-part question. First, you've got like the, the Buddhas before Gautama Buddha. And um, there is a text in the Pali Tipitaka called the, the Buddha Wamsa, which I'm pretty sure covers the 28 Buddhas. You know, it's 27 before Gautama. I think the Gautama Buddha was 28 in this you know, universal cycle. And then there's going to be Mateya after that. And if you read the Buddha Gos, if you read the, the Buddha Wamsa, You'll see that it, I mean, it's just unbelievable to a Westerner. Some of the some of the stories, like uh, Mangala Buddha. Look up the story of Mangala Buddha sometime. It was uh, it was it's very strange. I mean, it's just like Monty Python realm. It's so weird. And so Asian people can accept it without question. Um, Westerners generally cannot unless they're just the type that's very faith oriented and uh, are willing to just accept what they are told from, you know, a revered teacher or whatever. Um, and really, you can't say that there is a chain of these Buddhas because, I mean, there's no lineage, there's no succession because Buddhism or Dhamma has to completely die out before the next Buddha arises and he rediscovers it. So it's not like a transmission from one Buddha to the next. It's just that um, you know, Buddha dies out, it's discovered, rediscovered by a Buddha, and then it dies out, and then it's rediscovered by another Buddha, and then it dies out, and so forth. With regard to the patriarchs, yeah, I, there really isn't a lineage of patriarchs like there is in Zen. You know, you've got, I, I can't remember the number of Indian patriarchs, and then you have the six Chinese patriarchs. Um, and then, uh, who knows, I mean, it may be that Chinese or, or Zen monks in general or Mahayana monks may have a, like a more elaborate lineage, you know, it's like the Tibetan monks will trace their lineages back to uh, Nagarjuna or Padmasambhava or something. Um, with regard to my tradition, I mean, 
I was ordained in the Tong Pulu tradition. Tong Pulu was, um, he learned his meditation technique from, uh, it was uh, Miga Dawan Seattle. I don't even remember the, his uh, Pali name. But uh, that's about as far back. I mean, you could you could research it and go back maybe a few more teachers beyond that, or like like Goinka. I mean, most Goinka teachers or most Goinka meditators know that, that Goinka was a disciple of Uba Kin. Uba Kin was a disciple of some monk whose name I don't remember. They probably know it, and he was a disciple of Letty Seattle, who was a great scholar Seattle back uh, about a hundred years ago, and. Um, who Letty, they might know who Letty Seattle was a disciple of, and maybe two or three beyond that tops. And other than that, it's going to be mythology and just uh, guesses and so forth. So, yeah, it's, it does exist, but it's not nearly as important as in some other traditions. And, um, yeah, there's, like, the entire lineage um, may have been broken for all we know. Like uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan lineage was, uh, the Sangha was uh, pretty much invalid because so many monks were parajika or uh, you know, raising families or getting married and so forth. So they weren't really monks and any ordination that they performed would be invalid. And it was like that. And so that um, they had to send for real valid monks from, from Burma and Thailand to get the Sangha going again in Sri Lanka. So, um, you don't know if that sort of thing has happened, like late ancient times, early medieval times. Um, you know, it's just, it's all lost to, uh, lost in antiquity. So, um, I guess, I guess I answered that one. How far back can a typical Theravada monk trace his ordination line? Well, he knows what tradition he was in. If his teacher was a disciple of another teacher within the same tradition usually you know all the, the lineage within your own tradition uh, back to the founder and you may know who the teacher of your founder was and maybe the founder's teacher's teacher but then it generally just gets obscured and lost so the next question is from Chaplin and this one is similar to one that I already answered so I may answer this one in a somewhat abbreviated form but Chaplin says, what is up with the Western Buddhists in the comment section of your last YouTube video declaring that the Buddha never taught about reincarnation and slavery didn't exist in India, but was European slavery, I think Chaplin means here. It is true that these Western self-declared Buddhists do believe in everything that Buddhism is not. Do you see any way, any help or way forward into the land of authentic teachings for this, these misguided plebs? Um, well, some of them may see the light. I mean, if you practice, you're going to get wiser. I mean, that's the purpose of Dhamma practice. It can be said that that is the purpose of Dhamma practice is to cultivate wisdom. And so you may have foolish reasons for meditating at first. You know, you want psychic powers that you can impress that, that girl in history class or whatever. But then if you practice correctly, at least, even though you have sort of questionable motives at first, then you're going to make progress and then your your motives will get wiser. So, I mean, that that's possible. Um, yeah, getting back to the Western Buddhists, I'm, I'm not sure that the one that was talking about slavery was even a Buddhist. He was just kind of a, one of those Western um, authorities on Buddhism. Um, yeah, he was saying that there was, there was no slavery in ancient India and saying that there was no word for slave in Pali, which was Dasa. And... Um, now he was saying, no, nope, Dasa was in reference to some, like the, the aboriginal ethnic, ethnicity of the people living in northwestern India, or at least a, a aboriginal, an aboriginal ethnicity. And, um, and I, I just pointed out in a, in a blog post responding to this that, uh, you know, the English word slave uh, is pretty much the same as the Pali word Dasa, that slave is derived from the word Slav that slave and Slav are etymologically the same word because the Slavs were enslaved so much in like early medieval times, you know, they were a subjugated people that were sold as slaves that they just became almost synonymous. And that's the way Dasa was. Like the Rig Veda talks about the Dasa or the Dasyu as these little brown snub-nosed people that were being conquered by, by the Vedic, speak, Vedic Sanskrit speaking Indo-Aryans. 
Um, and so Dasa just came to mean slave, just like Arya came to mean noble or like the ruling class. Okay, and then with regard to the Buddha never teaching reincarnation, I have no idea how this person came up with that one because it's just throughout the Pali text. It would, must be like a lot of Western Buddhists who are willing to believe that the Buddha was enlightened or at least very wise so that anything in the text that they don't like has to be fake. It has to be added by, by later monks. You know, it's just corruption of Buddhism because obviously the, the enlightened Buddha would be teaching, you know, what Western leftists are saying now. It's, it's that kind of mentality as far as I can tell, at least with regard to a lot of them. And so, yeah, I mean, some people are so superficial and so selective in their Buddhism that they may not make very much progress at all. And so, um, oh, well, I mean, it's, it's probably been this way for a long time. Like, um, I read some chronicle of, um, or not necessarily a chronicle, it was one of those Chinese Mahayana monks a Chinese Buddhist monk who came to India to find books of monastic discipline that he can take back to China for the benefit of the Chinese Buddhists. And um, he claimed that at near Bodh Gaya, there was a, a monastery dedicated to all the Buddhas except Gautama. And they were, their lineage was started by Devadatta, who is like the Buddhist Judas Iscariot. So, I mean, there's been these kind of distortions and heresies in Buddhism for a very long time. Um, so, I mean, it's just something you have to contend with. And, and going with um, traditional Buddhism, a lot of these people are just going to go to hell. Like, there was one person, I shouldn't even mention his name, he was actually, he wrote an essay accusing Mahakaspa, who was the Buddha's chief disciple at the time of the Buddha's death or Parinibbana, he was accusing Mahakaspa of murdering the Buddha. And, I mean, accusing an enlightened being, assuming that Mahakaspa was enlightened and he was considered to be a fully enlightened Arahant by tradition, just accusing him based on just the flimsiest evidence of being a murderer. I mean, if, if you can believe what the texts say, then that kind of attitude really can lead to uh, some serious bad karma. Anyway, getting back to uh, Chaplin's questions here. The second question, how are your whippets doing? And for those of you who are not uh, studied in dog breeds, a whippet is sort of like a, a small greyhound. And we've got two of them here. And um, one of them is doing really fine and the other one is in heat. And so she has to stay outside or in a, in a big kennel kind of a cage thing, because otherwise she's going to be dripping uh, blood or whatever whatever that substance is that drips out of bitches in heat onto uh, the floors and the furniture and so forth. So she's been unhappy lately. But um, Safi is like a little princess, and uh, she's the only dog lately that's been getting full run of the house. I would like to have um, my dog, Genghis, uh, come inside sometimes, but uh, he's kind of a spaz, and uh, my sweetheart doesn't trust his behavior well enough to uh, be confident that she's not going to have to be cleaning up exasperating messes. But uh, Genghis is not a whippet, so maybe I'm just throwing that in. Just, just uh, what do you call it? I can't remember what it's called when you just sort of mention somebody's name, not name dropping, but. Uh, you know, a shout out, that's what it is. I'm giving my dog Genghis a shout out. And he's uh, half pug and half Boston Terrier. He's like this little cannonball. Okay, so anyway, the next question is from BPAT427. And BPAT427 says, I know you said you're not a fan of black metal, but are you familiar with power metal at all? Granted, it's pretty cheesy, but very uplifting and empowering. Huh. Yeah, I've never even heard of it until I got this question. It's like black metal with cheese, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, If it's very uplifting and empowering, that's that's good. I mean, I listen to lots of different kinds of music. I might like power metal for all I know, but uh, I, I've never heard of it before. So I'll just move on to the next question, which is similar in a certain respect. 
This is also from BPAT427. What's your opinion on Roman von Ungern Sternberg? And uh, I think I have this vague recollection of having heard that name before. Probably some very brief account of Roman von Ungern Sternberg. He may have been some Westerner who just went into like a, an Asian country and sort of set himself up like the man who would be king or something. But yeah, I, I, I don't know who it is really. I'm just guessing. So my opinion on Roman von Ungern Sternberg is I hope he was a nice guy. Next question from BPAT427. Would you ever consume a psychedelic drug at this point in your life? Oh, what a naughty question. As it turns out, I, I did consume one just uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I'm thinking there's a good chance I may consume such a substance again, such an entheogen, um, within the next few weeks. So, yeah, I would, I would ever, cons I would, uh, I would definitely consider it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I have uh, a few times since uh, I stopped being a monk. Ah, <sighs> yeah, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. So, yeah. Let's see. But I mean, before I became a monk, taking like psychedelics was pretty much my spiritual practice, at least at the practical level. You could say that um, at the theoretical level, you know, I'd be reading books and so forth, um, just coming up with my own theories. What well, as an actual practice, a spiritual practice, I sucked at meditation. You know, it'd just be a, it would be a, a, a real feat just to, to sit still for half an hour when I first started out. And um, so, like, one of the best spiritual practices I had was just go out into a wilderness by myself, usually, and, uh, you know, take a couple hits of acid or something and commune with nature, run around naked, maybe do a little fire sacrifice to the gods. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a consciousness-expanding experience. And I think most of the monks of my generation, including me when I was a monk, started off with psychedelics and then uh it's like you experience expanded states of consciousness and it really throws into doubt the validity of your normal waking state because you realize that this is just as valid at least as valid as my normal waking state certain aspects you know it's like a mystical state most of the times that i have taken psychedelics i have had real religious experiences and mystical experiences and so um in a way, it kind of helps you to triangulate. You know, it's like you've got more than one way of looking at reality. And um, so monks would, or people before they became monks would, would start with psychedelics, and then they would try to find some way of cultivating those same states of expanded consciousness uh, without the use of the chemical. But um, it's, it's taking the substance as a general rule is more reliable. It may not be quite as wholesome, but it's more reliable because you take the, the little tab of paper or whatever, and you got a pretty good idea that there's going to be something happening. Whereas with meditation, some people just naturally suck at meditation. They're just not very good at it. And it may take years of really strenuous effort to get to the same level of expanded consciousness that you could get just from taking one or two hits of acid or whatever it may happen to be ayahuasca or something so yeah this may be tmi it's, it's a long answer to a short question so i'll just move on to the next question which is the last question not only from bpat427 but from everybody this evening and you, as you can see it's nighttime now and i've got bugs attracted to the lights crawling on me and uh okay so the last question here is You've previously described loving a partner as poking a hole through Pink Floyd's wall. Could you elaborate on the meaning of that? I've never listened to the album The Wall or watched the movie, so it kind of goes over my head. Is the wall the ego's protection mechanism? Well, BPAP427 has just insinuated that he's uh, a youngster. I mean, it's just amazing to me. It's like more than 10 years ago, I was talking to this guy in his 20s. And I just happened to mention that there was some Burmese villagers that would make Jethro and Ellie Mae look like sophisticated city slickers by comparison. And he didn't know who I was talking about. He didn't know who Jethro and Ellie Mae were. 
So then I asked him, just kind of, you know, I'm kind of alarmed at this point. I asked him if he knows who Gilligan is, and yeah, he never heard of Gilligan. Strange. So Pink Floyd's Wall, um, it was arguably Pink Floyd's greatest album, in the opinion of most. It's not my favorite album. I prefer Wish You Were Here, but um, it's a story. It's a two album set telling this story about um, starting with childhood and it's just this person due to just the fucked upness of the adults around him and as he becomes an adult the fucked upness of the adults fellow adults around him that are just causing him to build this wall around his heart he's completely closed off and alienated you know he's got this wall around his heart to protect his heart but of course you know, it, it locks his heart in as well as locking all the, the possible dangers out. You know, all the people trying to hurt his feelings or, you know, trying to get him attached to them so that they can break his heart or whatever. So, yeah, it's like all in all, it's just another brick in the wall. It's like every, everything that happens to you, and, and, and especially in the case of some people, it's just adding another brick to this wall you've got this defensive wall around you that also makes you a, like a prisoner. And so when you're loving a person, if you sincerely love someone, you, you make yourself vulnerable to them. You have to make, you don't necessarily poke a hole, but you make an opening in Pink Floyd's wall. Everyone, everyone you know, except for like a, a full genuine saint is going to have, you know, some kind of protective wall. In my case, I think I was blessed um, in that, throughout most of my life my heart was sort of like a dehydrated apple and so it didn't get hurt easily you know it's like a little picket fence would be plenty of protection from my heart and you know i didn't need brick walls or, or bunkers or anything um so yeah I've, i'm i've been much more willing to take risks and um much more willing to make myself vulnerable just because I don't get hurt as easily maybe, or maybe it's just like an ascetic thing in me where I'm just willing to get hurt occasionally if I think it's worthwhile, if I think it's worth it. So I guess that's, that was uh, a blessing for me. I mean, the, the, the heart like a dehydrated apple maybe is not so great, but um, uh, I've been working on that. That's been one of my main, uh, my main avenues of progress in this life is cultivating compassion and love for my fellow human. Because for most of my life, I loved trees more than I loved the average human being. And, um, but I, I seem to be digressing here. So, I mean, when you love somebody, you're, in a way, you're, you're breaking down the division between self and other. You know, it, you just become an us. It may be that two people, like, let's say there's two delinquents that just madly fall in love with each other. You know, they might break down the wall between themselves, but they still got the the double the wall around both of them or something and um, but still i mean just to be completely closed off and alienated is is not a good way to live your life and a saint would have no sense of self they would have no purpose for a wall so like a fully enlightened being i assume has no no alienating self defensive fortification around his heart but um the average person maybe can't go that far so at the very least, you, you break down that wall towards one other person. And, um, you know, that's, that's healthy because to that extent, you're breaking down the, your, your alienation and you're just your concept of I, me, mine. You know, there's, a, there's an us factor involved. So, yeah, I never watched the movie either. It's, it's considered to be a great movie, like uh, Roger Ebert. The great, the God King Roger Ebert had it on his list of the greatest movies of all time, in his opinion. But it just seems so dark and depressing, and just I don't know. It, it was Pink Floyd in general is dark and depressing, and that's one reason why I liked, um, or why I do like "Wish You Were Here," because it was one of the few albums that was inspired by something uplifting. You know, there was the it, the whole album, as far as I can tell, was dedicated to Sid Barrett who took too much acid and uh, fried his brain or something. He just kind of went off the end and, and he had to uh, leave the group. And it was like dedicated to him just out of, you know, camaraderie or friendship or something. So, yeah, I mean, if getting back to the question above, I mean, psychedelic drugs, I mean, 
definitely there should be some moderation involved. You know, it should be used medicinally and not, not so much recreationally, but, uh, you know, you should use it with the right, right intentions of, uh, at the very least, blowing carbon out of your pipes. It'll, it'll knock you out of ruts. But Pink Floyd's Wall, yeah, um, I'm sure you can listen to it on YouTube if you're really curious. But, um, again, the whole, the whole story of Pink Floyd's Wall is just the lifelong process of just building this defensive fortification around one's heart to protect one's heart from being hurt, but at the very same time, you just become alienated. And, um, yeah, love is uh, a very good therapy to cure you of that. And that is the last question, so uh, I guess we're all done. And uh, I hope the exposure of this uh, camera will will be sufficient that... Uh, the uh, the optics here are not completely messed up. And uh, I'd say that if you have any questions, you're very welcome to ask. And remember, there are no stupid questions. Um, and just ask them below, if, if you please. Or if you have access to the Discord server, you can ask there. Or if you're on Subscribestar, which a few of you may be, um, you, can, you can ask your questions there also. And um, be happy. Oh, and, and buy my books if you haven't already. It's also in the down below. And be happy.